Um, so I, I try to recall as often as possible how many good things are going on in the world that are not reported on in the media and the news. And that's mm -hmm. sort of how I keep my balance when I'm overwhelmed by all the bad news that I see in the media. Yeah. Well, so how are you is a different question than what is your assessment of what's going on in the world? How so? That was well, a joke, Gil. I, 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 <laughs> I have a very dear friend, Ken, who um, whenever I ask her how she's doing, uh, the answer depends on the New York Times headlines that morning. Oh, mm -hmm. man. And so That's she's a... just buffeted up and down and up and down by, you know, other circumstances than herself. And so the difference is, you know, where's our center? How do we stand in the face of this? How do we breathe and move and, you know, and, you know kind of take all that in without being um, chained to the whipsaw? What? I think the main yeah, reason yeah, people course. ask the question, how are you, is yeah. to make sure the person they're talking to both is alive <laughs> and speaks English. <laughs> Mostly it's a ritualistic thing we have yeah. that we do. That, that yeah, is mostly the, people don't want a detailed answer to it, mostly. Right. right. But very long ago in some group discussion, uh, it was pointed out that if you answered the question sincerely, it would lead to interesting places. Mm -hmm. So when so after that for a while, when I hit how are you, I was like, well, let's talk about that. I'd like to pick up on Ken's view that the way to stay balanced is by looking around for good things that are going on. Mm -hmm. I have a different approach, which is to say, look, what's going on is natural. It just needs to be understood. Mm -hmm. And don't let the fact that it's I mean, bad stuff happens anyway. We're human. We're going to die. Uh, so it's a... Uh, and it probably comes from my having spent so much time in physics as to look at things the way they are. And that has the greatest dignity and actually the greatest centering. Or as maybe you're just a stoic through and through or some other philosophical stance that is exactly sort of what you just said. And, and that's what some people adopt, right? Yep. Stoicism well, is big in the valley. It's gotten quite a boom. Uh, Gil, were you going to jump in? Um, yeah, just uh, to what you what you just said last, it, it's gotten a big boom because it's very useful for a particular you know way of operating in the world. But I think to what you said, um, you know, we're always making a choice of what to pay attention to. We're always selecting out of the uh, uh, out of the wide swath of everything, and that's you know it's a personal choice to make about whether to be optimistic, pessimistic, realistic, stoic, or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. You know, do I wake up and get absorbed in the, you know, in the analysis of the odds of U.S.-China war, or do I wake up and go out and, you know, tend the flowers in my garden? That's the first thing that I do. What do I do? And and so under, under stoicism, I've got uh, stoicism is the best safety net for emotional freefall, says Tim Ferriss mm -hmm. in this article. And I'm I'm unclear that I'm of that persuasion that I that I necessarily feel that way, but uh, but it's certainly another piece of stoicism that I have is that uh, Silicon Valley is obsessed with stoicism, and there's yeah. just, the Stoa is a very popular podcast and, uh, yeah. and an interesting one, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I don't I don't sure, have do a you, lot do, of Stoa episodes. Do you have Byron Katie in here? Of course. Yeah, because I mean her 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 stance is I get sounds similar to what Doug was saying, which is that the root of suffering is denying what is. Well, her saying that suffering is optional is one of my favorite sayings out there. <laughs> um, she's not the only one who said that, by the way. Pardon? She's not the only one who would say that, by the oh, way. Oh, of course, of yeah. course. Um, you know, the Buddhists uh, say pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. Uh, that would be this one right here. There you go. <laughs> I have a great, I have a great an antidote. It, it, it's somewhere around the 1990s. I was really in a bad place for a, a while. And a friend of mine was a car salesman. And he said, you know, in the new models, Stuart, in the, in the 1991 models, suffering is no longer an option. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Like that, was, that was really good. <laughs> Hope you bought one. <laughs> 
No, it didn't. It didn't help. <laughs> That's very funny. Um, it is a great pleasure to see you all. I'm just wondering where the feminine presence of OGM has gone. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, but Stuart, you had proposed a topic on the OGM list a moment ago, and today is a topic quest. So um, pun slightly intended toward Jack and Marc Antoine, who run the Topic Quest Foundation. Um, but did you want to talk a little bit about the topic? It's funny. I think the topic is a good one, but I couldn't think of any place or any example right now. <laughs> the only thing that popped up was, you know, uh, my own learning, uh, you know, which was do what you can where you are with what you have. Um, you know, the, 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 the little small incremental things that we might do each day, uh, both in terms of the world around us, but also I think in terms of um, the presence that we bring to the world, you know, to, to, to just try and, 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 um, and be a, a little bit of a, um, an island of sanity, you know, in, in the context of things that are just um, really challenging if you're paying attention, challenging, unknown, um, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's funny, I'm going to find myself drifting into the opposite, but I'm not going to. Um, but I think that's, th that, that's the place to start in some ways. You know, the presence that we can, that each one of us has the capacity to bring to the world in the face of all the calamitous um, things that are going on. And, and, and in, some, in some ways, it all starts there. You know, we forget that. You know, our, our, our plans get to be, uh, uh, you know, a little bit more grandiose than we'd like to think in terms of how can we fix it all. But it all starts with the, the presence that we, that each one of us can bring to the world every day. I'll start with that. Um, Doug. Yeah, part of the stoic philosophy is to uh, leave alone the things that you can't impact and deal with the ones you can. It's always struck me that, in fact, the border between the two of them is not fixed. And we keep pushing uh, into what we can't control and try and make it something that we can have an effect on. And that's the drama of life is right at that border. And the Stoic philosophy tends to exclude that possibility. Um, there's also this sort of notion of we are like gods now. And we better better learn to act that way. That we are able to manipulate and do things far greater than we thought before, et cetera, et cetera. Um, which cuts right in there. Uh, Klaus. Yeah, I actually found an example, Stuart, for um, for some uh, a capacity out there that I was completely unaware of, and when, when preparing for these webinars, always forces you to take a deep dive into topics you're really unfamiliar with. And what I learned and I have this webinar this afternoon <clears throat> is that there is, an, there is an institution in the US that's called the Soil and Water Conservation Districts that I was sort of marginally aware of, but never really fully understood what that is. So under Roosevelt in the 1930s, uh, you had the Dust Bowl and the degradation of soil in the United States was just phenomenal at that time. I didn't realize how bad that really got. So it's like 70% of US farmland was degraded, seriously degraded, right? Where the topsoil would just blow off. So they formed um, the soil and water conservation districts, which uh, worked at ground level with farmers to translate science, I mean, centralized science, into a community level to where farmers were being informed and directed on methods they would have to use to restore their soil back to health. So today, there's 3,000 offices of soil and water conservation districts, which are directly in the community. And the, the uh, power of this thing is that often, most often it's, it's staffed with volunteers who are working in the community, who know everybody, you know, so, so you have this relationship, this relational trust uh, that is so important uh, for farmers. So then my question would be, 
you have all these carbon offset schemes and companies that are working to finance things and so on. And the question is, how do you scale anything like this, right? I mean, how do you, in a country the size of the United States and even on a global level, how do you scale uh, dealing with uh, millions of farmers who uh, need to need to go through adaptation and change practices? How do you allocate money efficiently you know, to farm operations? And here you have a network that's in place that could scale at really short notice. Um, but it's it's not even, I mean, even for me, having having been in this space for years now, have not been fully aware of this. this. So there is this manic uh, attempt by corporate structures to avoid government by all means and at all cost, right? So so they don't. They don't care what the capacity is out there. They just don't want to deal with it because that would force science into the process. Now, yeah? and and science forcing forcing science into the process is an inconvenient uh, 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 issue at this point because it means you have to change your business models at a at a massive scale uh, because you have to change the entire supply chain to accommodate farmers shifting into these regenerative practices. So that was just like like sort of one. It's out there, you know. There there are we have we have uh, institutional wisdom in this country because we've come through some really bad times, you know. Particularly when you think through the Roosevelt era uh, and the post World War II era, and the all the all the protections and mechanics that came out of fixing this collapse that we experienced uh, to put us back together. But now, you know, we are. Uh, mucked it back up and, and uh, lost our institutional memory. Yeah. Um, Julian, I'm going to mute you for a second. Um, we tend also to forget a lot of big important lessons, and then we tend to be really reluctant to go back and pop open the lid on ugly stuff, that, that a lesson that we needed to learn or that we are busy not learning or something like that. We're, we're very much very much like that. And some of that is about, hey, forget the past, let's just look forward and make it better kind of attitude. Some of it is defensive mechanisms against trauma and other sorts of things. I don't know. Uh, Gil, did you want to jump in? If yeah, I could just, just yeah, Gil, yeah, sorry, Gil. If I could just add to class, uh, what class was saying. Please. Uh, I, I was in the Smoky Mountains last weekend and a Great Smoky Mountain National Park, and there's a big plaque, you know, built by CCC. In the nineteen in the nineteen thirties, uh, you know, we forget we forget that and the huge effort that was taken in that moment in time and all that was created out of it. Sorry, Gil. Mm -hmm. It's okay, Stuart. So uh, also to Flavis's point, the the whole political uh, action to create the Soil Conservation Service, et cetera, only happened once the skies in Washington D.C. were darkened by dust from Nebraska. Exactly. It was theoretical until it impacted them personally, which may be what generates climate action here. To the to the plaque, um, um, I'm reminded. Do people know uh, Greg Bracken from UC Berkeley, geographer, has a phenomenal uh, presentation and slideshow about the impact of the Roosevelt era. And um, um, when I saw it, I, I grew up in New York City, and I realized watching this that the entire landscape of the city that I took for granted. Uh, the bridges, the parks, the tunnels, the libraries. So all the stuff was, you know, not all of it, but enormous amount of that stuff was built in the 1930s in the middle of the Great Depression when there was, quote, no money. But there was public will uh, to transform the landscape of the country. Can you share some links about Bracken? I don't know him or have him. Uh, yeah, I'll, give, me, give me a minute, but I'll get some in there. Yeah, thank you. You bet. Um, and, and, and in China, the same thing happened to Beijing. Um, their sky started to darken because of dust coming off the Lowe's Plateau. And there's a really nice documentary I'll put a link to in the chat uh, about the regreening of the Lowe's Plateau. And I think I told this story briefly uh, a while ago. Paul Fell joined our calls. Um, and it was that um, I had watched a video of Paul's talking about upward spiral and how he was busy healing some hillsides in the middle of California. And then a couple months later, I stumbled into this documentary about the Lowe's Plateau. L Lowe's is L-O-E-S-S. -S. Uh, it's, it's very friable, loose soil, but it's very fertile soil, but it 
it dusts up and blows away pretty easily. Uh, and there's a, there was an area the size of Belgium in the middle of China that was blowing away. And uh, when at the beginning of the documentary, which spans a decade, uh, the hills are brown, kids are sort of walking to school, but people are leaving. People are migrating away from this area, which no longer can support humans. And then they start doing at a civilizational government organizational scale what Paul Krefeld was doing single-handedly in the hillsides, which is they start digging uh, terraces into the hillsides, planting trees on the hillsides, doing a whole bunch of things for water catchment up high on the hill, et cetera, et cetera. And a, a decade later, the place is green. And at the end of the documentary, there's a, a woman who farms apples. She says, you know, a decade ago, I, I, I made like 600 yuan uh, a year, and now I'm making like 60,000 yuan a year from my apples. This is great. Uh, and I don't, I don't know what's happened since. But it took it took basically not being able to breathe in Beijing, I think, for that to become an important thing for governments. Uh, but I, but I wanted to head back also toward governments occasionally do really smart things, uh, and I keep going back to the folk schools that were across northern Europe and mostly in Scandinavia, uh, and they were started I think at the turn of the of the of the twentieth century, uh, and lasted. Uh, quite a while and then were gotten rid of but but a third of the populations of the northern european countries went through the folk schools which kind of taught civic life and mutual responsibility and things like that uh, which turned into a culture of mutual responsibility so um uh i don't know that los was world bank david uh dave i, I think it was a, i think it was in fact a provincial project but i'm not sure yeah, I think uh -huh. it might have been, and I think Ted Lieu is there because he was documenting World Bank stuff. So oh, interesting. That's where the uh, video comes from. Yeah, so Lessons from the Los Plateau is the video, and it is uh, John Liu. And, and, and John's trying to start some new organization, too, right yeah. now, so in the list of possibilities. Thank you. Um, Can I jump in, Jerry? Please. So this is, oh, this yeah. is Marshall. Okay. Um, you know, I, I take heart in uh, something that Adrienne Marie Brown says in, in her book, Holding Change, about facilitation, where she says that, that organizational change can be best facilitated by taking every opportunity to make explicit when an organization acts in support of its aspirational values and uh, and then pointing out when it falls short of that and it's just a, a matter of of repeating that uh you know at, at every opportunity to build momentum through small changes um adrian marie brown incidentally had a, a great interview on the stoa uh, as a, a guest there uh, but between, you know, many small changes compounding and looking uh, also for nonlinear uh, exponential uh, impact feedback loops, it, it feels like there's there are strategies available to us and and an overwhelming amount of good news and, and opportunities. You know, I, I hunt for good news for a couple of different outlets each week in, on climate at Exponential View. And then lately I've been writing a, a, that's large scale stuff. And then I've been writing a small scale newsletter stuff for the UN Adaptation Division uh, for the past few weeks uh, that I'm super excited about as well. And it, it, takes, it takes me and a teammate hours every week to dig through just an overwhelming amount of good news and try to figure out which of this uh, has the, has the best potential for outsized impact, but it's it's not a shortage of good news uh, in my mind. It's a it's a challenge of orchestrating it together and and overcoming the probably even larger amount of bad news. Thanks, Marshall. Uh, what has the habit of looking for good news done for you? Um, that's or to you. Oh, it's made me want to be all the more strategic about projects that I put my time and energy towards. Um, and it, it has, uh, it's probably cheered me up for sure. I mean, I, I was born on Columbus Day on the Bicentennial of America. So I've had a chip on my shoulder about the, uh, the greatest imperial power in history, you know, for 45 years, more or less. Uh, but uh, scanning for good news every day. Uh, 
yeah, certainly, certainly helps me uh, keep, look forward to where I want the, the bike to go instead of uh, looking towards the disasters. Yeah, I, I, and I, I think I'm, I think I'm, can easily say that one of the one of the nice things about OGMers is that I think all of us are working to bend the long arc of history toward justice and toward thriving for humans and and those kinds of things, and we're all we're all trying to figure out our own little mental models for how that works. <clears throat> like, where do you put your energy? Where do you, where do you, what levers do we get to use? Uh, where do we cast our energies in order to do, to have some effect on that process? Um, and I think our mental models are, are wide and varied. Uh, and then we started this call with something more toward coping models, which is, you know, how do you, how do you manage that? Uh, Dave, then Stuart. Yeah, well, I guess I was, and this is partly provoked because of the stuff about Lowe's and the World Bank, but I'm wondering if maybe we are, we, we need to look beyond, but looking for a great organization is a little bit looking, like looking for a heroic person, right? Everybody's going to have some screw ups, everybody's going to have some good things. And so and we need to, and we need to, if we're, we're going to mature to be able to recognize both, right? And we have to forgive and we have to congratulate and we have to, you know, I think we have to get a little more sophisticated. And I think organizations are, are probably that way. I mean, the World Bank has done some amazing things. There's great work that's happened because of the World Bank. And there's atrocious work that's happened because of the World Bank, right? And you have to somehow, I think, separate this stuff out. Um, and I don't know, it was somebody, was, somebody was asking about like, what are some regenerative companies? And it's like, I don't know. I don't know if there's any company that's like, quote, regenerative, but I think there are companies that have components that are regenerative. Right. And so I think we have to look at the components or the, you know, some some of the pieces running like I'm going to try to argue that like Google's, you know, uh, office stuff and Google Docs and all the, the services they provide you. That's flow. That's like enabling regeneration. You know, I don't know. I don't know what the advertising stuff does. That's a different problem. Right. But there are pieces of Google that I think are fairly kind of regenerative. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try to I'm going to try to argue that anyway, um, but I, I kind of wonder how much how, how how do we go about breaking these things into pieces and seeing, you know, seeing seeing the the good and the bad or something. Love that, Dave. Um, and I I'm cheating a little bit because I'm just showing uh, organizations building the regenerative economy, but most of these are not corporations making or 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 serving stuff. Most of these are organizations focused on bringing about the regenerative economy. So it's a a little bit of a cheat, but. Uh, but there are a bunch of a bunch of orgs, uh, including yours, uh, focused on this. Uh, Stuart. Yeah, I, I also wanted to add the perspective that, um, and I heard this many years ago, <clears throat> that in terms of uh, our own individual spiritual development, that this plane of existence, this material plane that we live on, um, it's the only plane where you can have the experience of of bodily feelings of rage <laughs> and and disgust and disappointment uh and it, here is where we get to feel when we're in a body as opposed to being in some transcendent spiritual place just a little piece of perspective it's not saying you know don't do anything to make things better because we're all here i think to, to do whatever you know we're driven to as a sense of personal mission, but it's just a a a a, a larger perspective. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so where do we take this? Um, what what? Klaus, you have a thought. You're muted, Klaus. That was a that first was, time on Zoom. Understood. That was a rookie thing. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, you know, looking through my image this morning, and I see Love Lock died, right? And the Gaia theory popped up again. And I remember when I first read the Gaia theory, that was you know, maybe five, six years ago so that I came across that. And it just seemed to be so intuitively logical, right? That this is how the world works because um life originates in the soil right and then you you have from there the, the course of uh, plants <clears throat> and you have the, the the entire animal life flora and fauna basically develops through the microorganisms inside the soil but then these the are uh, the, uh, these products then create 
oxygen, for example, right? I mean, the, the entire atmosphere is organic. So how can you cut down all these trees, uh, forests worldwide, and, and kill off the oceans, uh, the phytoplankton inside the oceans and so on, without expecting that somehow maybe we, we, we could be running out of oxygen? Right? So when you, when you understand the intricacy you know, of the, the complexity of this life that has formed over 4 billion years and that we completely depend on, even so we are so divorced that we don't recognize it anymore um that becomes pretty scary and then i noticed that lovelock uh, made the prediction that we have something like uh, 20 years left before the the this this complex life a form of life will break apart in its current formation and have to reconstitute itself somehow to maintain conditions for life but that may not include us anymore because uh, for example, maybe there is no more oxygen at that point. So, so the 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 we're still struggling, you know, to understand the enormity of damage we're doing to this planet on a on a global scale. <clears throat> we're still struggling with it. There's still uh, you still have Ted Cruz out there talking about uh, what is uh, uh, proven science, and 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 you think that the time is shrinking you know to really make an impact so you would basically need something like uh happened in the 1930s you know where you have uh this this huge undertaking of of inter of intervening of intervention to make any difference at all and and with every growing season that we, that passes uh, <clears throat> our chances exponentially diminish yeah so, so that, that's just, and yeah, it's just one of those depressing thoughts you wake up with. Indeed. Um, Doug, and then I'd like to shift us toward the question Marshall just put in the chat and ask him to maybe take us into it by riffing on it for a moment. Okay, well, this is in response to the first question uh, that uh, Stuart put up. And uh, for a long time, I've been very impressed by the fact that people do not have an image of where we might go as a livable future, not just the technology, but the day-to-day -day life of people. So it, I came up with the idea of putting uh, food and habitat in the same place so that you walk out your front door, there's the garden. Uh, and such a world is a place that's kind to children because they can just go outside and play. It's kind to to uh, older people because they can sit under the shade of trees but the idea of I've, I've called called it the garden world and uh it's an outlier but we need to have i need to have an image of where efforts are taking us uh that's livable so people can see how they could get out of their leaky canoe into something else uh, because staying in the leaky canoe, if there's not an alternative, is not crazy. And what we've known, mostly called denial by ordinary people, I think is not denial. I think it's just a failure of us to provide an imagination of what a future could look at, like that's worth working for. So anyway, Garden World is my modest attempt to try and lay out uh, that image and the politics that might get us there. Thanks, Doug. Um, makes a I'll lot put of a sense. link in the in the chat again. Uh, perfect. Um, Gil, did you want to add in here? Because I wanted to shift over toward Marshall's question. Yeah, if I could, and maybe it feeds into that too. I really applaud. Perfect. I really applaud what Doug is saying, and I applaud Garden World. Um, and um, this sort of thing has been a thread through all of my work going back to Institute for Local Self Reliance in the '70s, is highlighting things that are already existing and they're already working. Um, Ken Bolding used to say that existence is proof of the possible. And so in the, in the midst of the kind of stuff that the mainstream media covers, uh, many folks have highlighted the kinds of you know, small experimental creative initiatives. John Liu was mentioned before as one garden world is another. There's a flowering of innovation around the kind of garden world communities that I was talking about all over the world. Now, they don't make the front page of the New York Times. They're not on the nightly news, but they're there and they're you know, moving forward and pioneering um, techniques and relationships and political approaches and non-political approaches. So you know, the examples are there. And I think one of the challenges is how do we make them more visible 
and more tangible to people because when people touch them and experience them with their bodies, rather than reading a report on paper, things change. I remember early examples <clears throat> of people walking into um, you know, a lead platinum building for the first time and your body feels different. Now, if you work there, you feel there, you know, the air is different, the light is different, the way people move is different, experienced in the body. Um, that's a tangible example. When I was at, at, at Office of Appropriate Technology in the governor's office um, a long time ago, we ran a um, medicine show around the state of California with examples of renewable tech. And really notable was that people would look at the hot, the solar hot water heaters on the roof of this trailer. This is before PVs were common. Um, um, and you know, you talk about how it works and so forth. But what happened when you open the tap and someone could put their hand under the tap and feel the hot water, even physicists would light up like children with delight at the realization tactily of something different. So this is a long way to echo what Doug is saying that you know that that not the generating but also highlighting these examples of the you know the other world is here right now. Future is already here on evenly distributed, and that's both good and bad. And part of our job is to highlight the things that are going to appeal to people and bring people into motion about the world we want. Thanks, Gil. Uh, Mr. Kirkpatrick, you've got the floor. That was beautiful and inspiring from Gil. And, and it makes me want to, to add a little bit to what I was, was thinking by that question uh, of what affordances of a, an open global mind would be most strategic in support of all of these beneficial projects uh, and the earth and, uh, and that's to, to bring in an element of embodiment uh, from, from Gil. But I, I do think that uh, there's no shortage of exciting nodes in the network. Uh, and I, I think that, that one of the, the it, it would make sense to me as a, a foundational touch point to keep coming back to the question of how can we build uh, and highlight the edges that uh, connect the nodes. So that, uh, I mean, that, that feels like a, a unique value proposition uh, for this conversation uh, in this group uh, and where, where it's at. Uh, and, and what is it in terms of thinking about the, that interconnectivity and the open global mind that, that can bring a, a unique uh, contribution of, of energy to those movements. And, and at the same time, the, the dark side, the downside, perhaps of overemphasis on the, you know, the, the wiki like mind map, like focus on interconnectivity is that there's a risk of, uh, I know for me, uh, of being so awestruck by the, the uh, cerebral beauty uh, of, of these ideas and their interconnectivity uh, that we lose touch with the embodied direct lived experience of each of them individually. And so uh, digging into both the affordances of the modality and uh, keeping one eye on uh, groundedness uh, in the body and lived experience uh, feels like, like it could be two, two good sides of a, a coin to, to come back to again and again as we, we talk about these questions and the examples that come up in response to them. Um, Marshall, thank you. That's a really lovely uh, place to, to, to begin the conversation. I wanted to ask you to, if you would, to refine a little bit what you mean about bringing, highlighting edges that connect the nodes uh, so we can pull that closer to what we think. But also I wanted to mention that it's been, it's been a part of OGM for a long time uh, that putting up nice logical diagrams with maybe impeccable logic and irrefutable evidence is useless if there's no trust, if there's no connection, if there's no sense of community or, or oneness. And uh, Charles Blass mentioned long ago, and I, and, and, and I bought openglobalheart.com or .org, I think .com, as a complement to Open Global Mind and haven't done much with it. Uh, I'm happy to let anybody who wants to go play on the website and do whatever, but, uh, but trying to say that, that so much of this is about our presence, our felt experience, sharing our felt experience with other people. I'm a big believer that one of the largest 
uh, mo motivators or, or levers of social change is someone who's sort of like you, uh, taking you by the hand to try something new. That 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 just changes a whole lot of people because a whole bunch of new habits get caused by that act, repeated over and over and over again at very tiny scale, all around the world. And that's what builds communities. That's what restores habitat. That's what uh, pulls people out of uh, cults. That's what you know. It's it's like just hey, follow me and try this thing that that is really cool. Is, is a great thing. There we go. Open global gut, Ken proposes. I think that's a good mm -hmm. compliment here so that so that our second brains, which are actually in charge of the show, uh, can be can be tended as well. I'd like uh, to cut in here with a thought about nodes. And this is pretty theoretical. But the idea of a node implies a point that's very dense with information. And we try and attack it with logic. Instead of nodes, what if they are smears? that the information and our feelings about them are spread out, both the links and the nodes are really smears. And that suggests that the way to deal with them is not with direct uh, uh, penetration, but by resonating uh, in a more artistic and philosophical way. So the idea that the, of nodes probably supports the, a hard logical approach to what are really more emotional problems. It makes me think about I believe Friedhoff Capra says that everything is so connected to everything, so characterized by networks nested inside of networks that it's uh, it's a miracle that we're able to to really find any working knowledge uh, around any any given phenomenon, uh, given the the blur of of connectivity between all things. That's a great quote. I'd love to <clears throat> I'd love to locate that. Um, and and. And it's funny because I'm trying to operate at different levels of Zoom and different levels of fact and emotion. Maybe this is polarity management in a sense, but tools don't support it. Uh, polarity management says, hey, when things look really binary, what those really are is extremes to work into how you manage an issue. So, so a productive way is to actually go back and forth between the poles, between the extremes, so you're satisfying both and getting the benefit out of both. <clears throat> and here, tools tend to be one thing or the other. So if all of our data were suddenly to become smears, I think that that would weaken logical argument because you can't make logical arguments out of smears. But if there was an impressionist way to present pieces of argument, and I think storytelling is that, I think I think that storytelling is, is in fact a way of creating smears of emotion across things that are happening in the landscape, then and, and a tool that would lend itself to doing those different kinds of things together might be really powerful. Um, but our tools tend to be single purpose, single mode, single level of zoom, single lots of everything that we don't have transformer tool kind of tools, or and we don't have composable uh, tools that let us come in to the same set of bits of information and treat them in sort of novel and interesting ways. And I'll add one more thing to that, which is I kind of want this hold everything, you know, <clears throat> for anybody who watched Dick Tracy back in the day, you know, Joe jo Jitsu could say, hold everything and, and everything would freeze around him. Um, but then you could inspect a claim made or, or a piece of a story and you could unpack it and you could go, go you know, read the background and you could go figure out what it is if the story was amenable to that, if the story was connected to the, 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 the backgrounds or the things that it's building on. And then uh, as Marshall just said, quoting Fritjof, like everything is so deeply intertwingled and me, me sort of quoting Ted Nelson, uh, that this intertwingularity, and at some point I used to own the intertwingularity.com, but I got rid of it. I thought it was good, but I didn't do, any, I didn't do a thing with it because uh, that seemed like an answer to the singularity. Um, but but in my mind, when you complexify and take apart the, the 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 component parts, you can talk about some local zone in a satisfying way. It's not overwhelming as a big ball of, of thread uh, and twine. It's actually um, satisfying to do, and you can sort of you know keep uh, keep chopping away at it that way. Um, Stuart, then Doug. Yeah. So um, it's a perfect segue in some sense. Um, Schmachtenberger talks about um, <clears throat> our capacity to, I, I don't, I, I, my language is probably not correct, to change the algorithms of where some of the main social media platforms are driving us. 
and, and to change the values that are somehow embedded to do some of the things we're talking about. I mean, right now, as we all know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of sniping in social media. Um, there's a lot of dissonance. And, and how, can we, how can we tweak those in, in, in some ways to actually um, kind of create more groundedness of the kind of mindsets and thinking that will get us all to a, a, a different place? And I have no idea how to do that, um, but I, I just thought I was struck by his saying that that could have a huge um, impact. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, Doug B. Yeah, I the um, the the that whole the the sort of three references to nodes, edges, networks, and Doug's Doug's smear, which each time each time it it, it was invoked, I was back in H and H bagels. Of course, um, <laughs> but. Um, So one of the fundamental under you know sort of dualities of that is um, separation versus connection, and there's the one end of the curve. Everything is connected to everything. Everything is part of a whole, and the other extreme is the disaggregated, fragmented, um, uh, sort of grounding and centering and separation. There was a, a posting about a physicist who had sort of upended the vision and concept of um, uh, the, the, you know, thermodynamic law mapping to uh, spread and, and disorganization and disarray. And what she had in fact uncovered was um, that out of, out of emergence um, and entropy actually emerges order. And depending upon the, the, the geometric shape of the particles, um, that unbelievably complex, dense arrays of particles would um, actually end up ordering themselves in staggeringly concrete and um, and and um, coherent ways. And so, I. I think I keep coming back, coming back to sort of a, the fundament, which is, if if there's a different result desired, how do we orient differently to the question? How do we do us differently? And somehow, in that, I don't think there's a way of getting to what that different version is getting to the other side of us unless uh, unless and until we can stop being in the busyness and the doingness that in the way we're currently doing it and create the space and the room and the and the context not for purposes of getting to a kumbaya or you know an individual transcendence independent and disconnected from a practical how do we do this how do we fix this how do we change this it's how do we do us differently create the space and the moment and the experimental opportunity to experience and be in a different place orientation in relation to inquiry in relation to the question, what is needed? And um, it's, 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 you know, the guy chopping down the tree. Like, how is it possible to stop chopping, you know, and then figure out how we sharpen us as the ax? Um, and 
I haven't been, you know, I've, I've sought it. I haven't been successful yet in finding um, a robust array of folks to uh, go there with, with a level of, of commitment and urgency. But um, I think it's the only way we're going to get to not, not how to fix it or solve it, but at this point, I think the biggest call to action challenge and question is what's needed first, foremost, at the top of the pyramid that produces the biggest bang for the buck in terms of transformational shift of us as the, the agency of uh, our own dystopic demise by our own hand. You know, what's the, what's, what's first? And um, that question for me, because it's sort of like, if we're not starting at the beginning of the book in terms of the most effective intervention or construction or project or undertaking or thing to do, um, then uh, it's, it's sort of playing the same old forward and we don't get any closer to saving ourselves. So I'm unclear there is a most effective intervention. I'm unclear that there is a top to this problem. So what you're saying is puzzling me, and I'm wondering what your answers are to it. Well, honestly, I don't know that there is a that either. <laughs> so you just, you just sort of said there is, and if we don't do that, we're really fucking up. Well, it's more the inquiry of, you know, from a present moment right now, what's needed place and a concentration of of attention of resource of um energy and 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 to that like what's it and right now it's it's a miasma it's sort of this disaggregated massively complex and massively diverse and very um unintegrated um, array. And it's not any of that is invalid or not materially, critically valuable, important, intrinsic in terms of the pieces of the elephant. But is there, are there things like we don't know what is the greatest need in this moment that would map to the greatest impact with speed? And speed and, 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 and shifting large scale fast on a human being level, on a consciousness level, um, is really sort of important because otherwise we're off the cliff. Like how people are doing, what they're doing, how they're relating, you know, and all of the alarms and all of the data and all of that stuff has been out there for 20, 30 years, but what's going to move the dial in people's heads and hearts to mobilize? And that's never been more disaggregated, fragmented, alienated, and, and, and invalidated with, with all the fear and hatred and, and stuff that's going on right now. Like, I, so in that realm, there's something needed that isn't like, is, is, isn't being focused on. Um, and, and I don't have an answer. I don't have an it. I'm not attached to, you know, anything. But I'd love a group of people in a Manhattan Project kind of energy to come together to say, what's, you know, what's most needed right now that like maybe nobody has even got on the radar. So if somebody gave me a genie's jug or a magic button uh, that that would convert could, would convert things my one of my first answers would be i would love for every human to suddenly have a far deeper understanding of our interdependence and interconnection uh, because then we would realize that when we hurt one of us we hurt all of us there's a whole bunch of things that i think spill out of that and i have no idea how to drive that i mean we've joked on calls previously here we should invent a religion like l ron hubbard did for scientology 
and maybe maybe some and, and I own foobarism.com, which is a placeholder religion because foo.bar is a placeholder file name. Uh, and so if anybody wants to invent a religion to go, you know, foist on people that would that would cause us to understand our deep interconnectedness, I'm on board. I'd, I'd love to do that. But I don't know that that's the top of anything. I think that's just one little arrow flung toward the, the great miasma of, of, of things that we're kind of in. Um, Barry and Stewart. I'll nominate what I think I would put at the top of the list for what's needed. And... <clears throat> What I think is needed is insight. Uh, in, in my career, at the early part of my career, I was recruited to tackle hard problems, but they were tractable problems, problems that there was a reasonable chance that if we put our effort into it, we would figure out how to solve them. We're now at a point where we have problems that, near as I can tell, are intractable. We have no clue even how to begin to think about them or how to solve them. But getting back to the point of insight, um, Jerry uses the term mental models. Whenever I could see my way through the confusion and through the fog to devise a proposed solution to a challenging problem, the main tool was having a reliable system model. I would have to construct a system model almost from scratch because we didn't have one and then validate the model and then solve the model for best practices. And that's where the insight emerged. The insight emerges out of having reliable scientific or system models that explain how things operate in the world around us, and then using that knowledge to compute the solution for ethical best practices to solve the problem. So that's my nomination. We need insight, and to get it, we need to do research. We need to spend time doing research to understand the dynamics of these complex systems that are running out of control. And there are multiple candidate systems models. Uh, Scott Mooring, who is frequently in this group, uh, is a student of the Cabreras, uh, who have this model called DSRP, which I find interesting, but I don't know how to operationalize. I, I, and I've not taken their courses. I don't know the work. Uh, another friend, Glenda Oyang, has a, a different model that is very DSRP-ish and might be a good organizational structure, but we don't use these things and I don't know of any tools that enforce their use and I don't know how to go about using them to process the incredible torrent of information that's out there. So I'm, I'm interested, but I, I, haven't, I haven't been able to find the stepping stones that get me to use these things as a matter of habit and course, Barry. And so, so anyone who can who can bring that in to a group that's interested and make it uh, use more useful and tractable, I think that's a big win. It's just that uh, which mo which model? Because there's dozens. I just posted a link to my brain. Useful thinking frameworks and mental models. You will see that is a gigantic neighborhood. That is a really big neighborhood. And I love that thought. It's kind of, it's overwhelming and fun. And, and I think full of really useful links underneath. It has, it's linked to things like the OODA loop and, uh, you know, uh, Donella Meadows principles for, you know, leverage in a system and all those things are thinking frameworks, right? Uh, pace layering, Stuart Brand, uh, you name it. Uh, Stuart then Doug C. Yeah, so I'm gonna go back to this theme of individual action. Um, um, when I wrote a second edition to the book, Getting to Resolution, the last chapter was how life would be different um, if you adopted the, the models in this book. Uh, and I thought, geez, I need to change this story to make it more global because I wanted to have a greater global impact. But when I thought about it a little bit, I said, no, it, it really all starts with the individual no matter where we are. So somehow this uh, concept of wokeness, wokeness <laughs> or being awakened uh, has gotten such a, 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 a terrible connotation in the press. But at some level, we all need to just, you know, or more people need to just wake up and realize that life as it exists is not gonna go on. Um, I'll, I'll sit at a restaurant sometimes and I'll just look around me and I'll scratch my head and I'll go, geez, I, I wish people had some understanding of where we're headed if we keep on living in this way. Um, everybody on this call uh, gets up in the morning 
And, you know, we all go out and tilt at, tilt at windmills for eight or 10 or 12 hours a day, trying to be the best piece of contribution we can. You know, Peter Block says the answer to how is yes. So, you know, you just need to start someplace and, and, and keep on that path. And I think, I think you know, Barry, Barry's wisdom was you need a mental model of where you're going, some framework in which to hang your hat on context of what you're doing every day. But I, I agree with somebody said, you know, I, I think it was you, Jerry, can't think of a grand plan, you know, can't think of that one thing, mm -hmm. probably because there is no one thing. There are all of these little things that in some ways, you know, add up to making a difference. And, and maybe it'll all explode anyway, no matter what we do. But, you know, uh, let's, let's kind of be okay with that in the sense of having a mindset that we're out there tilting at windmills and, and, and it's gonna make a difference. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yeah. Um, Doug C. then Klaus. The projects that we work on, we would like to have succeed. So we create relationships and efforts and all that. But that creates a glue that keeps society where it is. Uh, maybe what we really need is for things, and I'm looking at this from a kind of physics point of view. What we really need is things to fall apart, create some entropy before they can reorganize in a new pattern. And our efforts to hold on are counterproductive. I don't know how to negotiate that world because uh, I think somehow we need a strategy that's both letting go and holding on to some things. Uh, Doug, we, don't need, we don't need things to fall apart. Things are going to fall apart just fine on their own. <laughs> well, but I think part of the problem with society right now is the amount of holding on, whether it's corporations, governments, projects. I mean, if you just got a grant uh, from the National Science Foundation to do something for three years, your basic view is don't talk to me about change until my grant is over. Uh, we're holding on. And I'm just saying from a really uh, tough point of view, it might be that the sandcastle has to fall apart before it can be reconstituted. Um, it's like activism is a lifestyle business, so is saving the world become. Um, Klaus and then Grace, please, if you would. Yeah, I mean, I'm coming back to hierarchy. Um, which you now seems to be uh, such a difficult concept. But what Donella Meadows basically proposes is that that narrative drives like software, you know, our way to interpret the world around us and uh, how we respond to stimuli uh, uh, around us. And it has to be hierarchical. So let, let's just come back to uh, this practical example of uh, Roosevelt, you know, creating all kinds of uh, government programs uh, to intervene uh, at a club, at a, at a national level at this point. Um, for example, that, you know, 70% of farmland was degraded, seriously degraded, and uh, you know, we could have uh, uh, you know, run out of food. And so here was a meta uh, uh, intervention, right? Top-down intervention. But then that, that doesn't really work, right? So they created, you know, and Roosevelt then created this network of in the community soil and water conservation districts, which connected uh, the, the, with, with this meta insight, but then interpreted it down to the local level where you needed adaptations that were clearly different in Florida than they were in California or in Kansas, right? So they were core principles uh, at meta level that had to be, that, 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 that were uh, looking for very specific outcomes, in this case, soil restoration, soil health, um, but that, that needed uh, local interpretations and adaptation. And so the toolbox was being provided at meta level and, and for the uh, very democratic implementation at local level. So narrative really drives us. And the problem right now is we can't agree on narrative because 
you have people working within silos. You know, you have you know, Walmart here and Kroger there and PepsiCo over here, and they all you know have investments, ideas, and they all know what they need to do to maintain their business model, right? Without uh, any consideration really about the externalities they're creating by uh, solving uh, a part of the problem, you know, which suboptimizes the system and all this stuff. So, so I, I, you know. The, the fight really is in narrative. And when you look at the information wars going on out there, you know that's where it is, right? Because, uh, uh, they, I mean, narrative has become weaponized. You know? And so, so you know, the, you have uh, uh, interventions into what people come to believe and what they come to understand about the, the reality uh, of, of, uh, you know, of the world around them making them act in ways that are actually self-destructive. And, and so unless we can win this information war uh, to, to agree on a common concept of uh, he, here's the trouble we're in, we can't act. Uh, and, and that's really the, 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 the frustrating part uh, that uh, the elites who, who are making these decisions are so far divorced from uh, on the ground reality that they they can't process what 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 uh, the situation is that we're in. So Klaus, I was like right with you until you said unless we agree on the story, because I because I'm unclear. We all need to agree on a story in order to get moving, and I don't think we'll ever be able to all agree on a story. In fact, half the population seems to be saying, "Hey, your story is bullshit. My story is real," and that doesn't really work. There might be an aggregation of stories. Uh, a miasma of stories. Maybe that's the collective noun of stories. I don't know. Uh, but but I'm trying to figure out how to harness narrative and story in urgent ways without necessarily saying we all need to agree on the story. Does that make sense or does that break things for you? That brings me back to hierarchy. So, so if we are saying that the restoration of the soil microbiome is a paramount design, uh, is, a, is a design imperative, right? then that means something different to the farmer in Kansas than to a city dweller in Los Angeles, right? And that's okay, because I mean, that's even necessary. So you have to, you have to flow that, so it means something different for PepsiCo because they will have to make adjustments to their supply chain to support farmers restoring the soil microbiome. So, so to bring it back down to what is the highest uh, imperative, and actually it's water, right? To restore water and water cycles uh, is actually, someone on LinkedIn was saying that's actually the Einstein equation, you know, the water and water cycles, because if you focus on that and fix that, you have to fix everything around it. Um, so, so yeah, so it's hierarchy in narrative. Um, that 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 has enough room for interpretation as it flows through the layers of the economy. Thank you. Um, I, Grace, we've gone lots of different places since you were piping in on the on the chat, but I'm I'm interested and I'd love to know uh, whatever your reflections are at this moment on this, including the religion you want to start. Hmm. So what we're talking about is infrastructure and systemic things about how the system works. But the way that I'm hearing the discussion in this conversation is a little bit like still looking at the objects, right? And when I think about the changes that you guys are trying to point to in this group, religion is definitely one of them. It's like, how does the entire society work? And what is the story that we tell? And we tell a particular story about individualism. And I happen to have come in when somebody was talking about how the individuals, uh, uh, the individuals uh, have to, whatever. And anytime you're like, all the individuals have to, it's like, well, that's the end of that particular solution. Because we're not all going to be enlightened. And some people get born, and then you know they're not enlightened when they get born, and you know, so religion gives answers to a lot of that. The, the financial system that we're in, you guys all know I talk about money. That's one of the infrastructure inches. One of you guys talked about winning the media war 
and the entire way that we inform ourselves of things. That's a flow, that's a whole infrastructure of how do we get our information, which is completely broken to the core. And supply chain is another one that I was starting to think about this week. I was thinking about like, what if every object you had built into the supply chain was it, not where it stopped in the consumer's hands, but how did it, like, where did it go and how did it end, right? And so then you'd have an object like this and you're like, okay, this can just go back into the ground, right? And then you'd have an object like this and it's like, well, if it didn't have that coating on the outside, it'd be a lot cheaper because this coating can never, like the whole, how, how, where are you gonna put that? But if this were just a piece of metal, well, we would have a way to manage the next part of this thing's life cycle, right? And so if every object had, I, I'm not saying it's gonna happen tomorrow or ever. I'm just saying that that's something we don't ever build into our supply chain. And somebody who I said that to said, oh, well, that's really complicated. And I'm like, well, how is that more complicated than how it got in my hand? It's the same level of complicated, kind of, you know, in, whether it's a phone or it's a this or whatever it is, it's almost the same level of complicated. Where does it go next until it becomes recycled? So it's not necessarily more complicated and we don't have structures like that. So that seems overwhelming. Like how the hell are we gonna create that? You know, fix all of those things. And I don't think we do fix anything. I think what we do is we create chunks of the stack that can be switched out or and or parallel society which is much more likely a parallel society is um going to i'll talk about the religion and the storytellers in a second but parallel society is like a group of whatever it is communities and looking at the community rather than the individual as the fundamental hold on. That is an individual doesn't exist in that initial system. There will be individuals that are only gonna be nomads and people who move from place to place, but in the initial construction of the system or in the base construction of the system, everyone belongs to a tribe. Everyone has a, has a belonging to a group, maybe to multiple groups, but th that we stop thinking about our economies, our supply chains, our everything in terms of the individual, but more in terms of the group. And that's how I'm starting to think about that um, and starting to build that. And I'm actually working on a fundraise through a DAO and I'll probably be making an announcement in the next few weeks that'll be a little more official around that about how we're gonna be fundraising for it. We've gotten very close to it and the religion is definitely part of it. One of the ways that we've decided that we would like to um, incorporate or create a legal entity is as a religion, um, not in the United States, but in, in a, as a religion because it's a legal entity that has a lot of advantages, but also because we are reconstructing the culture. And one of the things that we're thinking about doing um, is a kind of an NFT project where we would write a first draft of the canon with stories that we think are relevant but ancient stories, but maybe modernized a little, but we don't wanna make up new stories and new narratives. We wanna use the ancient wisdom, but it would only be printed on one side of the page. And then you would put out a hundred of them or 500 of them or whatever. And the holder of that would be an NFT holder. And after two or three months, they'd write their notes in the side on one side of the page, and then they'd pass it to the next person and then at the end of the year, those answers would be collated. So it's the same way that our can and most of our, I mean, maybe some of the canons were written by one person, but most of the religious texts are written by multiple people over a period of several decades. And I don't think that I'm gonna write the religion, but I could write the first draft with a few people, a few storytellers and, and, and collecting. And personally, the religion the stories will be stories that will be mostly featuring women and collectives, not men. And we'll only have priestesses at first until women are safe in the world. And then maybe we'll be able to ordain men, but until women feel safe in the world, only priestesses can be So there will never uh, ordained. be men ordained, right? I'm just Well, teasing. if the grandmothers have a say in it, maybe eventually yeah. we'll get, get you guys straightened out. I mean, I'm not hoping it to happen in my lifetime, but. <laughs> I'm with you. But anyway, so that's kind of the direction I'm thinking in it. And I'm saying it very, you know, in a very serious tone, but you know, it does have a little bit of an undercurrent of like, it's a little bit too crazy, but um, crazy is the new normal. And so that's sort of what I'm working on. And like I said, I'm gonna be 
having some really pretty if official looking materials and an official launch in the coming weeks. We have to get the legal entities in place and the um, the technical blockchain stuff underneath in place for the fundraise. Um, but we really do think that you have to create a parallel society that, and it, it's not something that's going to happen in three years, you know, it's something that's going to happen in a generation. And yeah, that's what I'm up to. Um, well, everyone knows that I'm the queen, but I think we're just going to have priestesses. And I think that we're going to all, you're going to have to, you won't, um, you won't go by last names. It'll just be divine. Everybody in who belongs to religion should just go by divine like the Janes go by. Just to remember that we're all, we're all part of the divine. Yeah. And we're all connected. Those are some thoughts. Story. Yeah. Thanks, Grace. Yeah. Uh, anybody with thoughts for, for Grace? Uh, Doug C. Well, one thing, the idea of a parallel society implies that the society that we have is coherent and working. Uh, and that you could build parallel to it. I don't believe it is something that's working. I'm not sure it's working. Oh, okay. But I think it's surviving somehow. Uh, Grace, sorry, you go ahead and. Yeah. Ahead. So, how I think about that in, is like really, I mean, I'm a little bit shallow. And so I think about that as an, in simple outward terms. So if I have a credit card and a passport, I'm part of the society. I can function in the society. And if I don't have a credit card or a passport, I'm not in the society. And so something that would serve the functions of a credit card and a passport that would indicate that you are a member of this parallel society. And I don't know exactly, and it wouldn't function like money, of course. It wouldn't, and it wouldn't have any exchange rate to the existing society. It, you could own both a passport and this other thing so that you could actually belong to both societies. But the idea would be that all of your economic and political and citizenship activity would operate under this new infrastructure. I like that. Thanks, Grace. Uh, Stuart, then Kevin. Yeah, Grace, um, the, the idea of women running society is a, a, a great thought. Um, my only suggestion is rather than othering men, the thinking behind why, all right, women need to be running society uh, is such an important piece, okay? Mm -hmm. That's a disingenuous statement from a group that doesn't have any women in it. Sorry. But you just, could you, could you, like, it's just could, like no pass. This group doesn't have any women in it. There's like either you've chased away the few women that are here or they just couldn't come this week or it's just I'm not othering men any more than you're othering women by having no women, no men, women in this group. And I think the reasons that women should run and hopefully and, and preferably older women should be running society have been built into ancient societies for a very, very long time. And women have an intrinsic mechanism by which they don't get to be individuals for certain months of their lives. Like they actually have to carry around another human being inside of them and feed it from their body. So they have an embodied experience of non-individualistic existence. So I can go through an intellectual argument about it, but it's not gonna matter. People who are gonna feel othered are gonna feel that. And, yeah, it is what it is. Grace, I don't, I don't, I don't feel othered, but I think the educational piece that you just articulated is a really important one. I agree with you. I don't disagree with you. I think you're absolutely right. I've been saying it for you know 30, 40 years, the the the, the, the same thing. Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I know. I, I get it. And and I think that there's different levels of society. And when you talk about religion, it's very interesting, right? So there's an educational piece, which is there's a certain strata of society that really needs that. And then there's a certain strata of society that just needs the rituals. We always did it that way. This is the way we did it. And there's a certain strata of society that is the mystics, which is definitely not me. But I know people who belong to that strata of society who have a deeper understanding than I do about what, what I just said. Like I said, it at a very superficial level. And I think that there are different strata and different levels of education. Um, I mean, nobody ever educated me why men should be running society. And I just had to follow the trade. It took me a very long time to understand why 
I had certain problems and certain difficulties getting ahead in society because we all took for granted that, you know, so the only reason that you need education, I think, for any of these things is because, in particular, in this particular case, is because women will have less tendency to defend their territory by physical means. And that's where education maybe can protect you. I'm not sure that this kind of society can be protected. I don't think it, in some ways, it doesn't have a chance. There's a, there's a piece of this also that's about stewarding, guardianship, uh, stewardship, uh, protection, that, that, that adopting a general notion of protecting the group, protecting the space, protecting the soil, protecting the ideas is helpful. And, and we've been missing that a lot. Uh, it's been very antagonistic. It's, we, we think of sort of doing battle in the arena not protecting the arena in some sense. And, and there's some there's something there. I'm just sort of, you just kind of triggered that for me, Grace. Um, Gil, Gil then Doug B. Grace, uh, I'm still there, Grace? Sorry. Yes. Yeah, are you, any speculation on why this group has not effectively brought in or retained women participants? And kind of side part of that question is why do you keep coming? And I don't know if that as a challenge, I'm really curious because we've, you know, we've expressed the desire to do that. We've reached out a little bit, but clearly we've stayed relatively homogeneous for a long time. Any insights? It's really hard to say, but there's like a, it's really hard to say, I, I, cause I don't know, right? But. And I've worked in very male environments and I decided about when I went through that thing a few months ago where I was like, I need to find co-founders. I just only asked women. And then recently somebody asked me to lead some panels on governance. And I thought, I'm only, I'm gonna make sure that the panels are four people and three of the four have to be women. And I had zero problem finding qualified women in the, in the specific things that I wanted um, that were really awesome and excellent and whatever. And I, I, I don't have any answers, but I do know it's solvable. And I was looking at one of the, one of the things that popped up. I can't read all the chats, but one of them that popped up is how do we get people over 50 to speak to under people under 30? And I'm like, what are you talking about? I have almost no, I mean, I love this group because it's one of the few groups of people in my age group that I belong to, but I belong to almost all groups. Almost all my friends are under 40. And almost all my colleagues in the disciplines that I work in are 40. And my co-founders, I think she's around 30. And you just do it. And you be selective about who you want to be around. And maybe ask your wives or, or one woman in your life that you think would like this group why she wouldn't join. I don't know. And I keep coming because I like you guys. And I've grown up in this environment. And you're a wise group of people who I just am very fond of. I, I don't, you know, and there's certain women group that I belong to, but there aren't very many that are, have the level of wisdom of this group. And I don't, I just haven't found them yet or I haven't created them yet. I'm certainly we starting. We haven't invited them yet. Hi. And, and yeah, and maybe there have to be separate groups. Like I feel like something like a game B women's group or something, you know, that's specifically only for women that can come to, you know, like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I have the advantage of I can start with just women because I am one. There's yeah. a small resonance when you talk for about running panels. I, a few years ago, I, I decided to stop participating in panels. I don't know. I'd be invited to panels and all of mine say, no, sorry, I won't do it. Why not? Well, because, and then people think, oh, well, actually, there's wonderful women to bring on. We, we quote, just hadn't thought of it yet, or just hadn't thought of them. And so it's that where, where, the, where the mind goes as to fault is really familiar, and it takes a little bit of a layer of pushing past that to say, um, when we were putting together Critical Path Capital, we, we got beat up by some folks, our advisory board was filled with wonderful people, and a, and a healthy, like, you know, 40, 45 percent women, but nobody could talk. Barkley. And I was challenged on that. And my first response, my knee jerk response was, well, I don't know the highly experienced people in the sustainability game who are people of color. And I just caught myself and thought, why is this bullshit coming out of my mouth? And, 
And in you know four minutes, I thought of twenty who I who are, who are ser seriously accomplished, highly respected, and who I know personally, and who we like each other. And I just hadn't thought of them in my first move. I started calling people up. I had three in no time, and so there we go. And it was the it was the default habit of the of the familiar world that I had to get slapped to step out of. And then so this enormous wealth of opportunity, people, richness, different perspective that I just wouldn't have thought of natively because of, you know, how I came to be. Thanks, Gil. So we all, we all have to remold that. Yeah. So, thank you. End of round. Um, Kevin, you were in the queue earlier and dropped out. I think you're probably next and then Doug B. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, on... on the Cherokee and often have clever ways around these things. You know, the, the, the Eastern band has a headman, but a few years ago, uh, the woman of the headman said, no, he's not worth it anymore. She went to somebody else and he became the headman. And it was like, if you've ever read the book, uh, Darwin's Rainbow, it's a pretty interesting thing about gender transformation in, uh, in, in things like fish, <clears throat> where it's all women, and but they need to have one of them become the big male who protects the women. And then when that one dies, another female becomes the useful big male that protects the, 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 the culture. So that was just kind of interesting. And also on churches, it, the U.S. has tax benefits to be a church that other places don't have. And they also have zoning uh, things that other places don't have. You can get around zoning if you call it a church. Uh, so those are just some, some interesting structural advantages on, on the U.S. That, is, that, are, that remain from when churches were more culturally central. Thank you. Uh, Doug B. then Carl. Yeah, just to, to um, sort of enrich uh, the subtext here. Um, in, in an elemental frame, and what I'm re referring to is, is uh, Himalayan tradition, five elements stuff. Um, earth and water are the feminine, divine feminine centered elements and all the nurturance, caring, um, feeding, supporting um, stuff resides. And, and moving up the elemental train, fire and air are masculine, uh, are, the, are the divine masculine elements. And balance by and between the elements uh, is sort of the, the holy grail. But in, in, in our societal frame, um, the patriarchy, which is you know, testosterone is fire and air. It's all rationality and, and data and information and knowledge and, and, and all of that, um, which is all air and um, fire, which is all uh, about transformation of things into energy, into light, into warmth. Uh, it's the feeding part, uh, the sustaining part. So, it's really easy to confuse gender and properties and attributes and energetic flows and qualities. And it isn't about gender, it's about the underlying substantive stuff around uh, divine feminine um, sort of properties and and the divine masculine and they are they are you know polarities that like at least in the natural world and and in the sort of spiritual and energetic realms are things that are that balance each other and we're in a system that is gro has been and is grossly out of balance <laughs> and it has been for a long time and and I personally really welcome the idea of divine feminine heading into a divine feminine period and, um, and having those qualities and those properties um, inform and guide what we're doing. So I just wanted to sort of stir that into the mix to take it out of the, the gender blur. Thanks, Doug. Um, Carl? 
On that last note, I was just having a conversation with Doug yesterday, and uh, one of the things that came up for me was uh, what a difference a word makes. And if we interpreted the word dom dominion that's been in the, the Bible with stewardship, and that kind of gets to the masculine and the fem feminine too. I actually am the one that had posted stuff about kind of 50 is the new 30 and there just seems to, I mean, I'm part of dozens of groups and there's hardly anybody under 50 in any of the, the groups I participate in. And uh, we've done some, we've actually got some generational um, um, pro, um, projects that we're trying to do, but it's how do we, how do we draw on those people? And then to, um, I also, I have um, two degrees in organization development. And I think that's the, that's the community to reach out to Grace. Cause I mean, there's probably been a, at least a dozen meetings in where I've, I've been like the only, only guy in like a meeting of 10 <laughs> or whatever. So the, the women, there's probably, it's probably about 70, 30 women to men in the organization development <laughs> area. Um, cool. I'm resisting the urge to bring up reproductive rights and the astonishing movement to limit women's reproductive rights in this country and my lack of comprehension on how women can't be standing up and saying, wait, hold on a second. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's like boggling to me. Um, Doug, is your hand still up from before? Okay, uh, Mr. Jones. Yeah, I have a friend who uh, did her master's on uh, aesthetic injustice, and it was the way the masculine form of communication and form filling out was <clears throat> hurtful to women in ways that the men didn't see what they were building. It's a pretty interesting thing. Uh, aesthetic injustice, it feels wrong. And yet by engaging, they're already, you know, engaging in the, uh, the terms of engagement that the men have set up. So it was a pretty interesting kind of thing. It's an awkward phrase for it. Can someone, can you or someone explain it better to me? It feels wrong. You know, and it's built to feel wrong and not pay attention to how it feels wrong. So by this group is, 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 a, is an extensively, extremely masculine form of communication. That's why women aren't here. This is, this is a men's play, playground. It, it's, it's, not, it, it's not more than that. It's, it's fine with me. I'm, I'm a white guy playing in this world. <clears throat> but, you know. Aesthetic injustice is, is not a phrase that you, you have to think about a bit, you know? Uh, how is the, the, the thing you walk into not built for you? Uh, you know, um, and, and if you're the one building it, you're not aware of it. That's, you know, the, the, the male unawareness of the systems that we invite everybody into and why can't they comply? Well, you know, the, it is, because it just isn't right. And it, and it isn't right from an aesthetic standpoint, that's her point. And, uh, and that it, you know, it, it, but if you start engaging transactionally around it, then you're, you're already, you know, playing on, the, on, on their turf. So in, in, it, it, it is designed to, you know, frustrate male logic. And, and I hope that's what it's done uh, by intruding here. Uh, Stuart, you but may I well think, have a, oh, go ahead. Please. I think it was interesting what um, I can't remember who said that the guy uh, about the groups that he belongs to, and he's saying like he belongs to a lot of groups that are a lot of women, but the other groups you belong to are the ones that are people over fifty, and that's sort of it, right? Why don't you step into the groups with the people that you want to mix with instead of saying, oh, they should come into like that's what Kevin's pointing to too. It's like oh, there's an aesthetic weirdness about it of saying, why don't they join our group instead of how about, why don't I join their group and see what that's like? Um, yeah. And I think a piece of what we're talking about right now clicks back to something that came up earlier in the call that I would love to spend more time on, which is how do we organize OGM to be of service to groups and issues and communities that we care about? 
And how do we organize OGM to do some more sense making around it? And one, one of my frustrations is seeing good ideas float by in the info torrent all the time and not be pinned into some space of shared memory. Uh, and I'm having a hard time explaining that in different ways. I spent an hour and a half with David Weinberger yesterday, who's lovely and a philosopher, and we were sort of kicking this around a whole bunch. And I'm just trying to figure out what is the right language. So maybe this is a topic for a future um, OGM topic call, because uh, it matters a bunch uh, what we're doing here. Uh, yeah, maybe our, our blindness to our male culture would be a great uh, topic, I think. Yeah. Yeah, which is which is exactly what I wanted to say. I want to thank and acknowledge you, Grace. Um, I'm sitting here in a place of uh, discomfort and sadness, uh, which is absolutely fine because that'll lead me to think, and 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 what you articulated that it's not even possible for me to understand what the difference is because of the difference in biological experiences, um, just touched me in a certain way. So th thank you. Thanks, Stuart. Um, as Thank a you. wrap, as a wrap, I'm going to read the poem that Ken posted earlier uh, in the chat, and he has just dropped off. I was going to ask him to read it, but I will do so real quick. Uh, it is Manifesto: The Mad Farmer Liberation Front, and goes as follows: Love the quick profit, the annual raise, vacation with pay, want more of everything ready-made. Be afraid to know your neighbors and to die and you will have a window in your head. Not even your future will be a mystery anymore. Your mind will be punched in a card and shut away in a little drawer. When they want you to buy something, they will call you. When they want you to die for profit, they will let you know. So friends, every day do something that won't compute. Love the Lord, love the world, work for nothing. Take all that you have and be poor. Love someone who does not deserve it. Denounce the government and embrace the flag. Hope to live in that free republic for which it stands. Give your approval to all you cannot understand. Praise ignorance for what man has not encountered, he has not destroyed. Ask the questions that have no answers. Invest in the millennium. Plant sequoias. Say that your main crop is the forest that you did not plant, that you will not live to harvest. Say that the leaves are harvested when they have rotted into the mold. Call that profit. Prophecy such returns. Put your faith in the two inches of humus that will build under the trees every thousand years. Listen to carrion. Put your ear close and hear the faint chattering of the songs that are to come. Expect the end of the world. Laugh. Laughter is immeasurable. Be joyful, though you have considered all the facts. So long as women do not go cheap for power, please women more than men. Ask yourself, will this satisfy a woman satisfied to bear a child? Will this disturb the sleep of a woman near to giving birth? Go with your love to the fields. Lie down in the shade. Rest your head in her lap. Swear allegiance to what is nighest, your thoughts. As soon as the generals and the politicos can predict the motions of your mind, lose it. Leave it as a sign to mark the false trail the way you didn't go. Be like the fox who makes more tracks than necessary, some in the wrong direction. Practice. Resurrection by Wendell Berry. And I'll repost a URL here. Um, uh, in my dojo, we were talking about one of the founders of the dojo, a woman named Yoko, who's phenomenal, and who I learned used to, uh, between classes be on the phone to everybody to like make sure they were in class and if she noticed somebody missed a class she would call them and all that and i am a terrible whip um, and i don't think whipping is the way to do this and i hate the word whip uh, but it was a thriving dojo under her reign partly because she deeply cared that people were participating and the people showed up and ken mentioned earlier that he had invited four women and they hadn't had a chance to show up uh, and i've done little of that uh, purposely, sort of intentionally, and I need to do more of that. So I will, I will do that. Um, thank you all for being here. I really appreciate this. Thank you, everyone.